All right, finally. So who am I? What's my backstory? Where do I get my money? What did I do in Hollywood? Why do I give so much away? Why do I only take pictures of Kara? And everything else you've been asking. If you really want to know who I am, then pack your bags because this is going to be quite a journey. Let's go back to where I started. I was born in Germany in 1962 with a very weak immune system. I was very, very sick. In 1967, my parents moved me to Ontario, Canada, north of Toronto, on a horse farm in the middle of nowhere, miles from the nearest house. My dad taught me everything from how to fix tractors and engines to fixing electrical fences, woodworking, carpentry, you know, basically how to be self-sufficient, which I'm very thankful for. We would spend evenings together trying to figure out perpetual free energy engines, all kinds of cool stuff. I was a nerdy little skinny, sick, weak kid that got beat up all the time at school, but I didn't care. When I was nine years old, I won a public speaking award for a speech I gave on exponential evolution. I was just in my mind all the time. My body was just a nuisance that I had to be in. I was fascinated with electronics and, and Radio Shack was my favorite store. I started soldering electrical circuits and making my own computers in the early 70s. In 1974, I made the New York Times by building a 180 square foot fully operational miniature model of the Walt Disney World Magic Kingdom. It was fully computerized, had two and a half miles of wiring, the rides worked, there was food on the tables, and it lit up at night. It was pretty cool. It was all made out of paper too. By 16, I was deep into theoretical physics and advanced electronics. This was around 1975 and I started making fantasy home movies with my dad's Super 8 movie camera. Remember those? little boxes. I started uh, messing with explosives to blow up miniature models and figured out how to make my own forced perspective miniatures and glass paintings, something which I ended up doing in Hollywood many years later. In 1977, the art director for the movie All That Jazz came up to the farm and after meeting me, said I could use some of the gear that MGM was using to make my own movie. It was like a kid filmmaker's dream come true. So I learned to use an Aerie 16 SR. I learned to edit on a 16 millimeter film on a Steenbeck flatbed. A lot of you probably don't even know what that is. This is before computers. In 1980, I went to art school in Sarasota, Florida, but quit because I was painting stuff like this in as little as two days, and teachers were asking me how I did what I did. And I ended up teaching night classes. These are some of the paintings I did. They were a combination of oils and acrylics on canvas or masonite. I got bored with that, so I quit. All right, 1981, I started working for architectural firms, building miniature models and helping design shopping malls, golf courses, and retirement communities. In 1982, I worked for a special effects company in Clearwater, Florida, where I built a miniature model of the Washington DC mall in nine days for the six o'clock news in Washington because it's illegal to fly over Washington. It lit up at night and there was even little tiny airplanes in the Air and Space Museum. Then the news station in Memphis, Tennessee found out about it and wanted a miniature model built of Memphis for them. So I built Memphis, the entire city of Memphis in miniature by myself in seven days. I felt what I was doing was too small time, so in 1985 I moved to Hollywood and immediately started working for the big effects companies like DreamQuest and Apogee, which is Grant McCune's company that did the effects for Star Wars. The first thing I did was paint the Mona Lisa on a 9-foot fiberglass dome for a Polaroid TV commercial, which ended up winning an Emmy. I painted the Mona Lisa in three days, cracks and everything. I'm not trying to brag or anything, it's just something that comes easy to me, and I, I really don't even like painting. I was a designer and sketch artist on movies like Total Recall, where I sat in meetings with director Paul Verhoeven, and I also painted a 35-foot backdrop of the Martian landscape for that movie. You know that scene at the end where the glass breaks and the Martian atmosphere comes into the facility and you see Mars outside? That's a 35-foot painting that I did in one day. It took me one day to paint it. 35 feet wide! That, that was a lot, a lot of work, crazy stuff. Anyway, I worked on over 200 TV commercials like Dodge, Chrysler, Sylvania, Pepsi. I was designer on Michael Jackson's Moonwalker video. I made all kinds of miniature models, painted matte paintings, and hand painted countless movie posters. I got tired of all that, so I moved over to fine art where I did paintings that ended up in galleries all over the world. Someone from NASA bought 10 of my paintings. It's kind of strange, but cool. Um, there's a coffee table book out there with my paintings in it. 
I wanted my work to convey a more peaceful, serene feeling that promoted deeper introspection, spirituality, and I don't know, just more meaning. Something I felt the world needed more of. <sighs> and I got burned out on that and stopped painting for good, and I haven't painted anything since, since over 30 years. I hung out with the Mensa crowd. I got bored with that, so I started hanging out with the heavy metal crowd. I had Matt Sorum's drum kit. I got guitar lessons from the guitars from Dio. The bass player from Quiet Riot hooked me up with what would end up being my girlfriend for the next 14 years. And I hung out with a band called Bad Angels. Here we are in front of the tour bus on our way to Vegas. That's me on the left. It's funny, people tell me I need to cut my hair. Well, compared to what I was back then, I did cut my hair. Anyway, I sold my house to Steve Adler, the drummer for Guns N' Roses. Steve and Duff would hang out on my back porch and chill. It was cool. But I missed filmmaking. But I didn't want to work on other people's movies anymore because it was all predictable, boring formula crap. I was like tired of all the mindless enter entertainment and pointless, empty violence in movies. So I started writing my own movie scripts. I started buying my own cameras, lights, dolly track, and even making my own props and miniatures. Word got out and I was given two and a half million dollars to make my own full-blown 35 millimeter full-length Hollywood movie. Now two and a half million dollars isn't really that much. It's like the price of a TV commercial, but by now I had learned all the secret Hollywood tricks on how to make it look like 10 million dollars. So I was determined to make something special, something that went far beyond what others had done with that kind of money. I storyboarded the entire movie shot by shot, every angle, every moment. I analyzed every single image and figured out how to build only what the camera saw, nothing else. I personally built over 300 miniature models starting with a dozen highly detailed chips about three feet or one meter long. They were mainly made out of paper and balsa wood and Christmas ornaments. To make it more realistic, I wanted people moving around on the decks. And this is before computer animation, so I created little motorized gizmos that would make the little sculpted people move. Remember, this is before computer CGI was around. The movie had over 300 visual effect shots and everything was practical, meaning no computers. It was all physical miniatures, glass paintings, forced perspective, and some front projection. So eventually we had to hire a real explosives crew and real stunt people. And the fire department had real fire trucks standing by. That was really cool. Whoa! Yo, baby! and a whole crew of miniature model artists building over a thousand miniatures. The exotic animals were brought in and we got some amazing actors like Billy Zabka from Karate Kid. Hi darling, my uh, I've been playing for all day. This is actual sculpt of my body that they made this suit out of. Um, they shrunk the chest a little bit so yeah. we reach something like that. Sarah Douglas from Superman 3. The problem is, is that you've not been properly motivating them. Joss Ackland from Hunt for Red October and Lethal Weapon. So this is where our desire for peace has led us. It's insane. And Christine Taylor from the Brady Bunch movie who ended up marrying Ben Stiller. Everything will be different. Our director of photography did Neverending Story in James Bond's Moonraker. A music composer from Canada went to Russia to score the soundtrack with a full orchestra and a hundred man choir. Remember, this is only a $2 million movie. To pull that off, mind blowing. An award winning French costume designer did over 400 period costumes. And even my old roommate from art school, Dave Dupuis, did the aging makeup. Now, Dave was by now very famous in Hollywood for having done the makeup effects in Stephen King's The Stand. It was an amazing amazing dream seeing all these really talented people help my dream come true. They believed in my script and what it was about. A love story that transcends time in a world where all countries end war and get together and fight a common enemy, the clock of time. It was a timeless fairy tale romance with epic battle scenes and lots of fun special effects. And in the middle of all this, I wasn't just directing and everything else. I actually was still building miniatures. Like I built a 30 foot miniature ship, which was designed to be a foreground miniature, all made out of paper and foam. And yes, of course, we blew it up. 
<laughs> I love blowing stuff up. The miniature team built an amazing 12 foot high castle and a bunch of other highly detailed miniatures. The only miniatures remaining are four of the three foot ships that I built way at the beginning. For almost an entire year, we worked tirelessly around the clock with very little sleep. It was exhausting, but something I will never forget. I could spend days talking about this, but I wrote about the entire experience in my book, Dream Chaser, which talks about how I went from having nothing. I mean, absolutely zero. I was broke to being given two and a half million dollars to make my own movie. You should read the book. What we pulled off was amazing, but it was very low budget. And you can tell, I mean, we were still lacking in some things, but we did what we could with what we had. It premiered in Man's Chinese Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, the most famous movie theater in the world, and it played in theaters all over the world and even aired on the Sci-Fi Channel for a few years. It was called To the Ends of Time. After the movie, I was completely burned out, as you can imagine, I didn't know what to do. So I get a phone call from Slash saying, hey dude, I love pinball games. Can you make a Guns N' Roses pinball game? So Slash and I flew up to Chicago to meet with Data East Pinball. So I ended up doing all the artwork for the game. And as weird and unpredictable as life is, I ended up becoming one of the top pinball artists in the world, doing the artwork for top games like Star Wars, Lethal Weapon, Jurassic Park, Tommy, Baywatch, Last Action Hero, World Wrestling Federation, and many, 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 many more. I was flown to Skywalker Ranch to personally introduce the Star Wars game to George Lucas. That was kind of actually embarrassing. I, I Star Wars changed my life. When, in 1975, I was a kid. That's one of the things that got me into movie making. I love Star Wars. I wanted to be a filmmaker. And here I am years later meeting the great George Lucas personally. And I couldn't really say, hey, George, by the way, I love filmmaking. I want to be a filmmaker. No, I was the pinball guy. It's like I finally get to meet George Lucas and I'm the pinball guy. It was so, I don't know, I, it is not how I wanted to meet George Lucas, but I've got to meet George Lucas anyway. So, um, People Magazine did a full page story on me. One thing led to another, and in another weird twist of fate, many of the top slot machines in Las Vegas in the early 2000s had my artwork on them. The Maryland Game, Sinatra, James Dean, Wheel of Fortune, and many more. Yeah, I was heavy into Hollywood merchandising. So once again, I got bored of all the commercialism and mindless entertainment and walked away. Health reasons tore apart uh, my girlfriend of 14 years, which opened my eyes to realize there's a whole other world out there full of people with health problems. The more I looked around, the more I realized nobody really knew what real health was. So my scientific curiosity once again kicked in and I wanted to see what would happen if I only ate the way nature intended. Just eat fresh, raw plants. No cooking, no baking, no boiling, no sugar, no dairy, no bread, no modern food, nothing. I started experimenting with different herbs and creating my own formulas, and the results were dramatic, to say the least. It was insane. I didn't even need glasses anymore. I didn't get sick anymore. No more allergies, no more asthma, no more colds or flus or aches or pains. It was like some Marvel superhero backstory. I had to tell the world about it. So I wrote my core book, Heal Yourself 101, and created thehealthylife.com. People started writing in from all over the world how they healed themselves of practically anything imaginable. It was mind-blowing. You can see a lot of them on MarcusTestimonials.com. I was flown all over the world to speak. Toronto, Hamburg, Berlin, Zurich, Switzerland, Munich, and Moscow in front of 9,000 people, and I even met with heads of government. Then one day, I was contacted by the military to be health consultant to a group of weapons of mass destruction first responders. They picked me up in a vehicle with blacked out windows and said, we have the package. I was the package. <laughs> they even gave me a medallion. It was a very cool experience. I, I, I'm very honored to have been a part of that. I now live in a house that three presidents have visited since it was built. I forgot to tell you the part where I, earlier in my life, I gave up on society and walked naked into the desert, not caring if I survived. I had my 40 days in the desert. I don't know if it's exactly 40 or not, but it doesn't matter. What walked in was not the same person that walked back out. I had a whole new way of looking at life. I realized there is no such thing as security 
Money comes and goes. The only thing that matters is peace and doing the right thing. I learned to admire things but not need them. But in so doing, I was given even more than I knew existed. I made a video about having to give 10% of everything you own. We don't own anything. Everything is just on loan to us. The more we learn to appreciate, the more we are given to experience. One of those amazing gifts is Kara. She's everything I ever dreamed of and fantasized about rolled into one. She ran two of the world's first gourmet raw food restaurants in California. Her regular customers are people like Steve Jobs, Barbara Streisand, Woody Harrelson, Kevin Bacon, Heath Ledger, Justin Timberlake, Jessica Biel, and many, many more. Now you gotta understand there's only a few raw food people in the world, and most of them are hippies, not glam queens who love to dress up. I didn't know it, but we both happened to move to Vegas and lived just a few miles apart, and then one day we bumped into each other at Home Depot and the rest is history. Some people ask, why do I only take pictures of Kara? Believe it or not, when we met, all I had was a pocket camera and a tiny camcorder. I wasn't really into photography that much, but she was so hot, I had to keep grabbing my camera because I couldn't believe what was standing in my living room. And I thought, you know, if she's gonna leave, I wanted proof she existed. As it turned out, she never left. She just stuck around and taking pictures of her became a hobby. I didn't really need a good camera until we created a cookbook together and I needed a decent camera for the food pictures. I got a Canon Rebel T7i and that was the start of me getting into photography. Kara was so beautiful and natural in front of the camera, I had to improve my gear to do her justice. Every time she went out to eat, she would dress up, look amazing, so I of course had to take pictures of her. And when we went on vacation, I figured out better and better ways to be portable but pack a lot of punch with lights and gear. I finally found something I really, really enjoyed doing, photography. And I was able to use my creative, artistic abilities doing something for myself for once, on my own schedule, not for other people. But I could simultaneously use it to show people what was possible if they had a healthy lifestyle and diet at any age. The fact that we're in our 50s made it even more fun because anybody can look good in their 20s and 30s. But to look like this in their 50s is living proof. So my pictures and videos started inspiring and helping people all over the world to a healthier lifestyle. And I love photography and tinkering and experimenting. It's what artists do. So one thing led to another and now I'm constantly trying to find the smallest, most lightweight travel gear that can take great pictures with high speed sync strobes, great audio and depth of field, but be as small and lightweight as possible. I don't need the biggest, fanciest cameras out there. I don't need to impress anybody with my gear or anything. I just want to be free to travel, capture beautiful images and create beautiful memories. Kara is the reason I got into photography so we can capture memories to look back on years from now and say, remember when we look like that? I am not a professional photographer. I don't get paid to take pictures for other people. I don't want to do that. I just want to have fun taking pictures of Kara and make videos that inspire people. That's it. Interestingly enough, Kara is basically Cinderella. Her three brothers and sisters always got the attention and she was the one in the back doing the dishes. She never got to have the fun the others did. Her dream was just to someday be photographed by a professional photographer so she could feel good about herself. She made my dreams come true and I do my best to make hers come true. All right, how do I make money? Many people think it's from my herbal products because that's all they see. I originally created the herbal products just for myself, using the most expensive and rare exotic herbs I could get because I wanted to see what would happen. Then other people asked for them, so I started sharing them. And eventually I started selling them just a little bit above cost. There isn't much profit in those because of their expensive ingredients. And then the fulfillment center and customer service eats up like the rest of the, the profit. So that isn't really a profit. So that's kind of just my service to help people heal themselves. Over the years, I started investing. The moment I got some money, a little, even a little bit, I would reinvest it. And over time, that all adds up. I started getting into real estate, stocks, metals, and all kinds of stuff. So now I have a pretty diversified portfolio spread out over all kinds of stuff. And over the years, I met a bunch of people who helped me with investments, including an advisor to British royalty. 
I don't buy big expensive things that go down in value, like American cars. My big expenditures are things that go up in value, like Italian exotics. And I don't get anything I cannot pay for in cash. I try not to finance anything if possible, because that's how you lose everything. I made a video here about how I was able to save for many of the things in my life by simply never drinking alcohol ever in my life or smoking or any other bad habit. I give 10%, not to people who ask for help, but to those who don't. And usually it's not people, it's animals because they don't have a choice. I'm a total recluse and if the whole world just vanished or disappeared and it was just me and Kara, I'd be okay with that. I've lost everything I've had many times over and learned that we really don't own anything, everything is just on loan to us. As for YouTube, I couldn't care less about subscribers or clicks. None of my videos are monetized. My Core Heal Yourself book is free. My herbs are basically sold at cost. I make free videos showing people how to gain financial freedom, how to regain their health, how to have great fulfilling relationships, how to make a difference in the world. You know, I'm here to inspire, not to cut people down. I promote constructiveness, not competition and negativity. We need to honor and respect each other's differences and work together, not against. Just learn to appreciate the beauty in your life. There's lots of magic all around you. You just have to change the way you look at things. Stop dwelling on the negative and look for the positive because you attract what you dwell on. I'm almost 60, but I'm still a kid. I refuse to grow up. I love photography because it captures beauty, but it also allows us to create fantasy worlds we can escape into. Life is short. Make the best with what you have. Leonardo da Vinci created masterpieces with a stick of charcoal. A single mother living in poverty scribbled some fantasies onto a piece of paper. The name of her scribblings was Harry Potter. She is now a billionaire. It all starts with your heart, not by copying others. Do not copy me or anyone else. Your path to freedom comes from following your own inner voice. And your happiness and peace does not come from money. It comes from you being free to be yourself. I wrote two books about it, a little pocket book entitled Instructions for a New Life, and a hardcover book, The Prosperity Secret. The best investment you could ever make is in yourself. It takes time. It took me almost 50 years. It does not happen overnight. So be patient and just start following your own path. I gave up everything I had and walked naked into the desert. I had nothing. There is no excuse. You have to start somewhere. Be patient and just start doing the right thing. It all starts with feeling peace and giving love.